Welcome everyone to the uh, most recent installment of the 2DCC webinar series. Today we have Dr. Tanu Chaudhry. Um, she's a research associate here in the 2DCC on thin films, and she'll be talking about uh, gas source CBD. Tanu? Right. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, first of all, I would like to start out by welcoming all of you people in the room and on the web. So I am, as Kevin said, I'm Tanu Chaudhry, and I'll be I will be talking about uh, the work that they're doing on the epitaxial growth of dichalcogenide films by using gas source chemical vapor deposition. And I'm hoping by the end of the talk, I would have addressed every part of, you know, every component of this title. So first of all, before I get into the work, I want to just give you a favor or a brief overview of the 2DCC. The framework it has is in three parts. You've got synthesis, the in situ characterization and the theory and simulation. All of these work together with the idea that we are trying to develop strategies by which we can de deposit or grow high quality layered calcogenide materials. And in, in that process, we are hoping to understand enough about the processes that govern the growth of these materials. Um, so what we are working on specifically is the thin film part of it. We are looking at chemical vapor deposition to grow transition metal dichalcogenides. We are also looking to incorporate in situ characterization like ellipsometry, Raman spectroscopy, and photoluminescence so that we can gather information about the growth as it happens or by gathering information about these samples without exposing it to an ambient. Um, so, first thing that I'll talk about is the, the CVD part of it as to what we are doing. But before we get into that, the people who are involved in this effort are shown out here. The faculty members are Professor Joan Redwing and Joshua Robinson. That is me, the research associate. We have postdoctoral scholars and graduate students who are working on their own uh, material of choice. And these are the people who are the ones who are going to grow the films when the user proposals come in. Um, so now, let's get started. Why exactly are we talking about these materials? Well, Rafin started it all. We have a layered material which has amazing mobilities. It's chemically inert. What Rafin did in addition to that was also divert attention towards the whole class of layered materials where you have different kind of properties. You can have insulators for HBN, you can have semi-metals, you can have superconductors. All of these are layered in their structure. What we, and what we are specifically focused on are the transition metal dichalcogenides. So we are trying to grow semiconductors, which are electronic grade, which can be used for what typically semiconductors are used for. Now, what is so special about these materials? Structurally, when you talk about it, and this is something that I think all of you have seen at some point, but I'm still going to spend some time on that. Like, first of all, they have very strong covalent bonding between the metal and the calcogen. The black dots are the metal, and the yellow dots are the calcogen. But they have very weak bonding between the layers, which means that it's possible for us to separate out individual layers, a few layers, and have stable arrays of these materials. Uh, now, the TMD films, as such, have exhibited a variety of interesting properties. For example, the property that you see are layer dependent. In case of MOS2, you can go from an indirect band gap semiconductor in the bulk to a direct band gap monolayer. As because there is no out of plane bonding, it is actually possible to make heterostructures without lattice matching because you don't have to match the lattices, as because there is no bonding between the layers. In addition to that, for TMD monolayers, given strong spin orbital coupling and lack of inversion symmetry, you are actually able to have value polarization. If you have a a variety of TMD set on top of each other. You can also have interlayer exciton, and that energy of that exciton will depend upon the choice of the material and also the related orientations. Not only that, these materials are extremely sensitive to the environment, which can be a detriment, but it also can be exploited to impart some additional properties to these materials, as was done by in this particular case, where they've used two, G, two layers of graphene to introduce a band gap in between, or uh, introduce or modulate the band gap of the tungsten sulfide layer underneath. Now, using these properties, a couple of applications have been explored. For example, tunnel diodes and transistors, flexible electronics, excitonic transistors, photovoltaics and chemical or biosensors. But for most of these applications, the requirement is monolayer film or the possibility of growing films where we can control the number of layers. Now, how do we get to that? The way to get to monolayer films has been, it's been very successful, which is by exfoliation of bulk crystals. So you take your bulk crystal and then you use a scotch tape and then try peeling it out as much as possible till you get a thin layer. This is what was the, the Nobel Prize was about this, right? Uh, but the problem with this technique is that 
the size of these layers are of, in the order of tens of microns. So if you're talking about making vapor scale devices, which is what we are typically used to, then this is not a very ideal process. So one method of going around it is to grow these materials. And one such technique is the powder vapor transport, where the process involves, includes, you have uh, different kinds of powders, the so precursor powders of molyoxide and sulfur, which is sitting inside the reactor, very close to your substrate. So as you're heating it up, the molyoxide vaporizes, the vapors react in the chemical phase, and then finally deposit on the substrate. What this gives you is the composition that you need. You have MOS2 films, which have large enough domains, but you also can observe that there is a non-uniformity in the growth. So if you want to go over, talk about vapor scale growth, it becomes difficult to get this using this particular technique. Not only that, I mentioned that we would be interested in growing heterostructures. It would be wonderful if we could grow these materials or heterostructures without exposing it to the ambient. In this particular configuration, given that your powder is sitting inside the chamber, it becomes a little difficult to achieve that. And that is what gets me to the gas source CVD part of it. So this is a typical schematic of what a CVD system, a chemical vapor deposition system looks like. It has various components. I'm going to walk you through it. I'm actually borrowing this slide from a webinar that Professor Redwin had given uh, on the uh, on the 2DCC webinar series itself on the MOCVD growth of 2D calcogenides. So you might want to even look that up. You'll give you, get you, get you some more information about the whole process. Um, so to begin with, first of all, we start out with sources, which are solids or liquids, and they're placed outside the chamber. Now, they usually contain the stainless steel bubblers or some container where we can control the temperature and the pressure. And by, using, by doing that, what we do is we control the actual concentration in this particular source and we introduce gases into the reaction chamber. We're no longer relying on having a precursor in the reaction chamber to get the growth happening. In addition to the metal source, which is typically a liquid or a solid, mostly solids in our cases, we also have a hydride source, which is a source for the calcogen. Now, it can be a variety of gases which have been used so far, like silane, but for what we are focused on is hydrogen selenide and hydrogen sulfide. And using these hydride sources, the advantage is that you can minimize the carbon contamination in the films. That can happen if in case you have metal organics. So when we talk about MOCVD, that's basically a subdivision of chemical vapor deposition, which is based on the precursor you use. If it's a metal organic precursor, you would call it MOCVD. Otherwise, all of these are different sections of like a chemical vapor deposition process. Now, in addition to the precursors, so in this particular case, both are precursors, the metal, the metal and the, the calcogen are both sitting outside. And what is entering is the gas source, just the gas precursor into the reaction chamber. For us to get uniform growth, there are other components that are helpful. For example, the run vent assembly that allows you to switch the precursors between the reactor and the pump. And that, is, that allows you to form stable flow of these gases while you're switching them out. The heart of this system, however, is the reaction chamber. And what we typically use is a cone wall system. What I mean by a cone wall system is that your substrate is being heated up specifically, and you're keeping the reaction chamber, the wall of the reaction chamber, the container, at a cold, uh, lower temperature. That is done so that we can minimize gas phase reactions. Also, we can minimize contamination when we switch material out. Now, in addition to the control of the temperature, it also is important to control the pressure. And that is done by using an assembly of a vacuum pump, a throttle valve, and a pressure gauge so that we can control the pressure from milliliter to atmospheric pressure, depending on what your requirements are. Now, one thing that I want to stress on is the kind of gases that we're working with or precursors we're working with are hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen selenide, highly toxic. Most of the metal organic precursors are pyrophoric. So it's extremely important to make sure that you handle all of these gases, all of these precursors in the safest way possible. Safety data sheets are our friend, and we should use them as extensively as we can. And one more thing that's usually a part of any of these CBD systems is that most of this is enclosed in a ventilated enclosure which is equipped with toxic gas and flame detectors. So that we can make sure that even if there is a leak, it's contained, and nobody who's working on it is exposed to it. Another component to the CVD system is uh, that whatever gases come out as a result of the reaction is usually fed into something called a scrubber, which literally scrubs out all the hazardous gases and gives you, or the resultant is something which is benign and does not necessarily harm the environment or the people involved. So all of these allows us to control the precursor concentration in a reliable fashion. And if in case we're talking about heterostructures or combination of materials, it gives you the ease of switching them out. And using the reaction geometry, we would be able to control the uniformity that we get. For our films, or for our, what we are trying to work on, we, these are the typical examples of the reactors that we're working on right now. 
So we have again, we have a cold world vertical system and a horizontal system. And what we're trying to do is these are all equipped with uh, different kinds of precursors. For tungsten, for example, you have tungsten hexacarbon and hexachloride, molybdenum, niobium, selenium, and sulfur. What we're trying to do is develop a way in which we can understand how the growth happens. And for understanding that, it becomes important to know what, I'm sorry, sorry. It becomes important to know what the flow dynamics are. These lines show the flow dynamics of the precursors that, you're, that is entering the gas chamber. This gives you a profile for how the, temp or the gas velocities <coughs> change, and this gives you the temp profile for how the temperature changes. All of this allows you to understand how the deposit is going to happen in your system. So as a part of the work that we are trying to do, we want to grow high quality films. We are trying to understand our system well enough that we can I mean, understand what the mechanisms are and also be able to predict how do we control the growth under different growth conditions. Um, so moving on, what we are trying to grow is, as I said, high quality material. We want to have lesser number of grain boundaries. And if we have grain boundaries, we would want to have these grain boundaries um, as, with as little uh, angles between them as possible which would mean that we want a, a substrate which can impose an orientation on the domains which are growing up. So if you see in this particular case, um, this table shows the different kind of lattice parameters that you have for these crystals. So if you were to take sapphire, which has the same symmetry as the hexagonal crystal of the tungsten, um, the TMD that we are trying to grow, what you find is that the lattice mismatch is around 13%. But when we consider three unit cells of MOS2 and two unit cells of sapphire, you're actually able to mitigate, and the lattice mismatch is just about 0.4%. Um, and that is the reason why we're able to now see, when you look at the domains of MOS2, they're oriented with respect to each other at 0 and 60 degrees. In case of gallium matter, the lattice parameter variation is even lesser. And there again, you start seeing that there is an orientation relation between the domains, which means that even though there is no out of plane bonding. You are still able to dictate how the material grows out. You are still able to impose an orientation of these materials, which would mean that when they coalesce, you are reducing your grain boundaries, which are usually the defect sites where scattering happens. So the challenge for us is the growth of monomers. What we want to grow is large area, single crystalline or as single crystalline as possible, and so that we can make <coughs> devices out of them. Now there are certain challenges and requirements that have to be met. One first important challenge is this, that we're trying to grow a material which are extremely dissimilar. We have a transition metal, which has a very high melting point, which means the vapor pressures are really low. So it wants to sit on the surface and not go anywhere. And along with that, we want it to react with the calcogen, which has a very low melting point and the extremely high vapor pressure. So it is important for us to understand that given this, we have to find a way that we can increase our calcogen amount so that we can force the calcogen to stay on the growth surface enough that it can get incorporated. The second challenge or the requirement is to get a substrate, which given the information that was obtained from powder vaporization studies, that sapphire, given the symmetry it has, is actually able to get the epitaxial substrate. And that is what we have been working on for some time. Now, the next requirement for the TND monolayer is we want to, first of all, get epitaxial orientation. We want to get large domain growth. So we want these domains to grow out laterally. But we also want to create a situation that you do not have bilayers mutating at the same time. So if in case all of these conditions are met, we should be able to get monolayer films of the domain sizes that we need. So in order to you know, uh, try to get to the coalesced monolayer films, a uh, strategy was developed, which consists of multiple steps. The first, so this is what we have. the three steps in it. The first is the nucleation step, which uh, the schematic shows uh, what happens in these two different steps. In the first step, we have a high tungsten carbonyl flow rate. What we're doing by that is we're introducing a lot of nucleation sites on the surface. We control the nucleation sites in this particular step. Depending on the amount of tungsten carbonyl you introduce, you control the number of nuclei that you form here, which in turn controls the domain size that you finally get. In the next step, what was done is that the tungsten hexagonal was removed, tungsten source is removed, and we anneal this, these clusters in a hydrogen selenide environment. So during this whole process, even though we're modulating the tungsten hexacarbon the hydrogen selenide is being maintained the same way. So during the ripening process, what happens is that these domains start to grow out, form triangles, and they actually get oriented. And that is where your epitaxial relation is set in. After that, what we try to do is reintroduce the tungsten hexacarbon, but we reduce the amount of the tungsten hexacarbon. The idea being that we are trying to reduce the supersaturation of the concentration. So we are making sure that whatever nuclei is there is what grows out instead of nucleating more on the surface. 
So using these three steps, as you can see uh, from the AFM images below, you have the nucleation step, you have the oriented domains, and then you get the lateral growth stage. So you have been able to find a way that you can get a coal and spill. But that's because we are separating our nucleation step. It's also allowing us to study or probe the mechanism by which the growth happens. So if you look at the ripening stage in details, what we see is, so in this particular case, the nucleation was done at 800 degrees C for 30 seconds, and we ripen it for different periods of time. What you have here is just small clusters. Uh, you can start seeing domains at this particular point. The domains increase, the number of domains increases, and finally the number of domains increases even more. But, or rather, it right now remains the same. So as you can see from the domain sizes here, it increases when you are going from 0 to 15 minutes, but after that it almost becomes a constant. So if you look at high magnification images of these areas, what we find is that in this particular case, after 5 minutes, you have lots of small clusters and some domains which are present on the film. But finally, around 30 minutes, all the clusters have pretty much been consumed up and all that you're left with are triangular domains on the surface. So now if you look at the dependence of this domain size and the cluster density, from the experimental data, we, we find is that the dependence on temporary or on time is something that corresponds or is consistent with the classical 2D ripening model. So from here, so if you consider that these clusters are coming together, they're migrating and they're coming together and coalescing, it's actually possible to find out surface diffusion coefficients of these species or these clusters, which is the rate limiting step or which is what controls the lateral growth of these films on the surface. So here what we have is, you have these clusters which are separated by an average distance, and this is the typical uh, length by which the cluster can move. So this is the average cluster displacement. So using this model, what we have is that if in case the average cluster displacement is around half the, the separation between this, these two uh, clusters. And from the cluster density, which we are experimentally observing, we can actually find out what this average length is. And from there, we can extract the diffusion coefficient of this tungsten cluster. Now, having done the ripening step, uh, we now move on to the lateral growth step. Oh, sorry. The, this basically shows how the dependence is when you, when you uh, plot it with respect to the ripening to the power of 1 by t or the cluster size with respect of 1 by t. Okay. So now when we move on to the lateral growth stage, what we see is that in this particular case, we have kept the ripening stage constant for 10 minutes because that's when we see that we get most of our triangles which are oriented in a particular direction. And then we are increasing the time for the lateral growth. And what we find is that as we keep growing, the increasing the time, after about 45 minutes, we now have a completely coalesced layer. But around 50% when the monolayer was formed, we also start forming a bilayer. So even though we, would, we are reducing our concentration of trans hexacarbonate, we are still impinging enough on the monolayer that we are now beginning to nucleate out, out more numbers of, uh, or more bilayer regions. So we're trying to see what we can do to reduce it. One of the ways would be to reduce the tungsten hexacarbonate a lot more. And there are ways in which we have been able to combat it. It's mostly monolayer films that are made by this particular technique. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that you have, if you look at the triangles again here, what you find is that they have an orientation relation with respect to each other. They are at 0 or 60 degrees with respect to each other, which is similar to what we were seeing or what was observed for MOS2 and Sapphire, which indicates, again, that you have a preferential direction, and that is because of the substrate underlying which is imposing an epitaxy on these films. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, as I mentioned, we are separating out factors now. So we have a separate step, which is mm -hmm. nucleation, and then we're trying to do the lateral growth separately. So in this particular case, what was done, so we're trying to see what happens or what is the influence of the growth parameters on the lateral growth step itself. So in this particular case, what was done is the nucleation stage was set at 30 seconds and 800 degrees C which controls the nucleation density. And that was done so that we can have large domains because the lesser number of nuclei is going to give you a larger number, larger domain size on coalescence. We kept the ripening step the same um, at 800 degrees C. And then the lateral growth stage was, in the, or was explored from 600 to 900 degrees C. So if you look at the domain size or the domain density from 700 to 800, 900 degrees C, it seems to be completely unaffected by the temperature. What that indicates is that in this particular case, the growth is just limited by how much material makes it onto the surface. And there is no kinetic barrier for the growth to happen. However, at around 600 degrees C, you start seeing very small nuclei forming, which, is, which indicates that at 600 degrees C, we are not just having a lateral growth, we are also introducing more nucleation on the surface. And that happens because, as I mentioned before, tungsten has a very, very high melting point. So it doesn't really want to diffuse a whole lot if you don't give it enough of an impetus to do so. 
So at 6 nm, you see it sits on the surface, forms an addition to the nucleation site, and that is the reason why you get this kind of a growth. Okay, now in addition to that, if you look at the morphology of the triangle itself, you have triangles in, uh, at 700 degrees C, but at 800 and 900, you start seeing truncated triangles. If you look at literature about the growth of these materials, um, something can be said about what is really going on at the growth front. Right? We have, so for example, if in case this is our nuclei or crystal that we consider for the tungsten selenide, if the ratio of a selenium to tungsten is 2, then what you should ideally get is that you should have both tungsten terminated edges and selenium terminated edges, which would mean that it would be a hexagonal crystal. But then if in case your selenium vapor pressure or the selenium amount is a lot higher than tungsten, then you're going to have only one particular edge which is going to be selenium terminated or whichever it is. It could be tungsten terminated if in case you have a tungsten rich environment. What this goes to show is that irrespective of what you're introducing into the surface, at that temperature at the growth zone, you are actually manipulating the sulfur, the selenium to tungsten ratio enough that now you're beginning to modify the termination that you get. So in order to check or to confirm that that was really true, what was done is the hydrogen selenide ratio was increased and that again gives you back the triangles. So this shows that there is a way for us to control the termination that you get by controlling the amount of precursors that we are putting in. So irrespective of what you are putting in, it's important, all of this gives you information about what's really going on at the growth front. Um, moving on. Now I've been talking about epitaxine and we've been saying it based on the fact that the triangles seem to be oriented with respect to each other. But it would be also nice to know the epitaxial relation with respect to the substrate. And in, for this particular purpose, Mikhail came up with using the in-plane XRD, which is typically used for finding out the orientation relation for normal semiconductors, and applied it to this particular technique of the 2D materials. And what we find is that if you take the traditional uh, XRD that's used, the thickness that we have with material is very thin. So when you look at the theta to theta scan, you're going to find just very broad peaks for tungsten selenide, just because the material is so thin. But if you look at from the point of view of in-plane XRE, that means your incidence is very close to your sample. Now you are talking about the whole, the whole crystalline array is available for you to probe. And using that, this is the theta to theta scan, which shows the peaks for the alumina and also tungsten selenide. And when we look at the five scans, what you find is that you have an epitaxial relation which can be now probed very easily without taking the sample off or without trying to do something like read or lean by just using XRD to see what the epitaxial relation is. Uh, so in this particular case, this six-fold symmetry that you see is usually, it is a factor, it is there because of the fact that your crystal itself is six-fold. But what we find is that now the epitaxial relation is 112 bar 0 plane of tungsten selenide is parallel to 112 bar 0 of sapphire because both of them are hexagonal. So, uh, in addition to finding all the epitaxial relation, these things were also looked at in the TEM to see the plan view to get an idea about what kind of defects we have in the films when there are domain boundaries. And in this, uh, the process that was developed for transferring the films was using water that was done by Fu and uh, Professor Nassim Alem. And just using water after coating the samples with PMMA, it is possible by capillary that the TMD film just peels off. And then on transferring it to the grid, they were able to look at what this uh, structure looks like. And out here, these are the antiphase gain boundaries that have been formed because we do have a predominant 0 and 60 degrees. There are two different orientations that we have for the tungsten selenide. Uh, now, why is that a problem? In case of TMDs, it has been shown and it has been predicted as well is that when you have these domains which are oriented in one direction and the other one at 60 degrees with respect to it, when it grows out and finally stitches, this particular domain boundary that you form is going to be metallic. <coughs> in so now we're talking about having a semiconductor matrix in which we just interlace with metallic lines here and there, right? However, the best situation would be if in case all of these domains were oriented one particular direction. So there is no mismatch. And then when it matches up, it's going to form a perfect crystal. Now in case of sapphire, we're not able to do that. But uh, Xiaojun happened to look at what happens when we grow these films on HBN flakes. And what we get out here is, if you focus your attention on the AFM images out here, that you have most of these domains, or, or the plot out here, that most of these domains are oriented one particular way with respect to the other. So now we're increasing the number of domains in one particular direction, which means in, in, in turn that we're going to reduce the number of anti-phase grain boundaries. So seeing this particular property of the orientation, what was also observed is that when you look at the PL, if you look at the sapphire PL, there is, uh, 
uh, distribution or in the peak positions, and that is attributed to the strain in the film. But in case of BN, first of all, it's pretty uniform. The fear, the film with half maxima of this, or the PL's peak itself looks a lot more intense. So it does seem like the HVN would be an ideal or would be an interesting substrate to contemplate for the growth of these materials. But then right now, we do not really have large area, good quality HVN materials available. So what we are focusing on right now is to see what we can get from uh, sapphire itself. And after having obtained the process by which we can grow over one centimeter films, uh, we one centimeter substrates, we moved on to scaling up the process so that we could grow it over two inch diameter wafers. And this is the system that we are using for it right now. What we have is a glove box out here which allows sample loading and unloading in a controlled environment. That way we don't expose our chamber to the ambient under any circumstances, or mostly not if it's not needed. And it also allows us to seal air sensitive uh, samples right after the growth is done. Uh, again, we have a cold wall system. So this is what our uh, chamber looks like. It's a quartz tube which we are cooling down with a water jacket. And this is where our graphite susceptor. So we are heating that up. And that's where our substrate sits. Now, as is mentioned out here, that we have the possibility of adding six liquid or solid sources. Right now, we have tungsten hexacarbonyl, molyhexacarbonyl, and niobium chloride. And we have uh, it hooked to hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen selenide. So the process that was described before, the three steps that we used, we tried to use it and we tried to make tungsten sulfide films. And we have been able to grow, make films now of tungsten sulfide, tungsten selenide, and molysulfide on this particular system. When we were trying to establish the process for tungsten sulfide, however, we realized that things were not as simple. First, I am going to direct your attention to the graph on the left. Out here, what you have is the five scans of the tungsten sulfide films grown at different temperatures. So first thing that I want to point out is that you can see peaks at 0 and 30 degrees, which means that you now have domains which are oriented with respect to each other at, uh, with, like, at around 30 degrees. But as you're continuously increasing the temperature, what we find is that this becomes a lot more complicated. You start seeing domains present at other angles as well. So even though this is epitaxial, that is the substance is definitely doing something and making it oriented, but then it's not, it's not oriented in a variety of angles. Now, why does that happen is something that we did not know. Not only that, when we look at the growth per se, or we look at the morphology, at 750 degrees C, we start a lot of, a lot of out of plane growth, which is usually observed when the growth rate is very high, and that is seen if in case at lower temperatures because things don't have enough time to diffuse out. So as you keep increasing the temperature, you are increasing your domain size and reducing the out of plane growth. But the question still remains as to why do we have such a complicated epitaxial relation with the substrate. So uh, as I mentioned before, that the calcogen that we're using, sulfur or, or selenium, has a much higher vapor pressure. Sulfur is definitely a lot more volatile than selenium. And maybe that is the reason why we're having an issue. The sulfur does not want to stick around on the surface. Maybe that's what's messing up with the growth. So in order to explore that, what we did was we looked at the growth of these films at around 950 degrees C, where we varied just the hydrogen sulfide concentration, keeping everything else the same. And what we find is that by increasing it just around 200, 320 SEC, and we are suppressing all other orientations, and now we have an epitaxial relation with the substrate, the way we were getting for tungsten selenide. Using this, we were able to get these monolayer films. Um, now, as uh, the substrate that we have, even though it's a two-inch wafer, we are able to rotate it so that we can get uniform growth. So what it is shown out here in the AFM images is that the edges uh, have a monolayer. All of this have an underlying monolayer. There are some bilayer regions. And the density of the barrier region is slightly higher in the case of the center than in, on the edges. So when we look at the PL of these films, we now find that there is, again, strain in the films, and there is a distribution. The PL peak does not really stay at one position, but just move around. But the biggest takeaway from this particular point was that the calcogen concentration is now playing a role in obtaining epitaxy. So it's not just necessary to have a substrate that can impose epitaxy. We also have to consider what is the role of these precursors and how they are making the film epitaxial. Is it because in case of selenium, it has been observed that there's an interfacial layer that forms? Is it because we don't have enough sulfur, the interfacial layer cannot form? Is that the reason why it happens? It's something that we are still trying to work out. We don't know what the reason is to why we get epitaxy when this happens, but that's something that's work kind of in progress right now. Uh, so as I mentioned, after having figured this out, we also were able to deposit films of MOS2, which were monolayer films and epitaxial films. So we are moving on in other different directions, where one of them is that we want to grow uh, alloys and heterostructures of these materials. So this particular structure, this is the AFM of just tungsten sulfide, and this is the in-plane XRD for the tungsten sulfide. 
but then when we start the, on the right is the same image which we get for the alloys of these. So the black particles that you have, the, dark, the lighter parts or the darker parts are the moly, and the tungsten is the brighter part. It is an STM image. And what we have in this particular case, so what we're trying to do is to grow from go from zero percent moly to hundred percent moly, and to see what really happens to the alloy that forms. Is it ordered? Is it disordered completely? Is that going to affect things? What we find is that when we are looking at the alloy films, we start seeing a variation in the PL, which is expected because now you're changing your composition, so you're going to change your modulate your band structure as well. We are also looking at growing heterostructures of these materials. So this is something that's just started out. We still are working on getting our process right. So in addition to this, we're also looking at other ways. As I mentioned, nucleation density is what controls the domain sizes. So we're trying to see if what we're trying to look at now is if we can control the nucleation density. So one of the strategies that we have for it that we're looking at right now is using defects in another two-dimensional material and using that to control it, the nucleation sites. So for example, in this particular case, what we started out with is epitaxial graphene. This is silicon carbide, which when heated up, the silicon sublimates under special conditions and uh, your carbon that you have on the surface rearranges to form a graphene layer. What we did was we introduced plasma, or we treated it with plasma to introduce defects in it, and then we introduced, took the same sample and introduced it to a growth chamber, which had tungsten hexacarbonyl hydrogen sulfide. And what we find is that when you look at the pristine sample, which means it has not been exposed to plasma, most of the growth is concentrated along the step edges. But when we look at a plasma treated sample, then we seem to have modified the sample enough, the, uh, the, uh, the surface enough, that now we have growth happening on the terraces as well. So this seems like an interesting way of controlling where the defects are going to be. This also is a way in which we can understand how exactly do the defects interact with the precursors that we are using. And hopefully using this, we will be able to control the defect density and then get much larger domain material. Um, now I mentioned in the beginning that there is, in a part of 2DCC, we have uh, not just the people who are doing growth, but we also have a very strong theory support. And what we're trying to do, or one project that we're working on right now with the theory extensively is this, where we're talking about reactor modeling and simulations. Uh, what is being done out here is, uh, Professor Audrey Van Duin is uh, using the active force field to develop the, or to calculate the, the gas kinetics or the rate constants for the gas reactions that can happen. And uh, Professor Glanchuan is using uh, computational fluid dynamics so that we can predict what kind of gas phase chemistry we're going to have for the system. Now, this is the system that we're talking about. So we have injectors through which we introduce our metal and calcium precursors. And so this is the area where we are interested in. That's where our growth happens. What is shown here on the left is the concentration of tungsten hexacarbonyl, hydrogen selenide, and carbon oxide, carbon monoxide. Now carbon monoxide is what forms when hexacarbonyl breaks down. On the right, you have again the decomposition of the, the distribution of one particular species that is expected to form during the reaction in the gas phase. Why is this important? Um, the gas phase chemistry that you have, the uniformity of what you have in the gas phase determines what kind of film depositing you're going to get. That determines the reactions that you're going to have on the surface. So if in case, so what we're trying to do right now is that they have these models, they have these numbers that they have calculated. We are now trying to see if we can actually correlate the deposition that we get at different pressures. And from that, the information we would get is that how right these numbers are. And not only that, we will be able to extend the growth space without actually doing the experiments for it. So if in case we do a couple of runs to confirm these numbers are correct, we now are developing predictive models or the predictive capability to say what rate, uh, growth zone you should be trying to get a uniform growth of one particular property that you're interested in. And only that, if uh, these uh, calculations are correct, then if anybody else's reactor has these kind of uh, precursors, we can still use the same uh, the kinetic factors and try to model what's going to happen in your own system. Now, in addition to all of this, we are trying to for, we're trying to extend the capacities into the in situ characterization. So this is a, a system that's going to be installed in mid 2018. It has multiple modules. We have a transfer chamber through which we can load or unload our samples. And that is done so that, again, we don't expose our growth chamber to the atmosphere. We have a stainless steel chamber, a vertical system in this particular case, which has optical ports where we're going to use uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry. The idea that we want to look at the growth as it happens and hopefully understand a little more about this and the process. We also have, in addition to it, a Raman and PL chamber. 
and we are hope, and using this transfer chamber, we would be able to transfer the samples between these chambers without exposing it to the ambient. So this is going to have similar capacities in terms of the kind of materials we'll be growing on. We are still focusing on transition metal dichalcogenides. We will work on tungsten hexacarbonyl, tungsten, work with tungsten hexacarbonyl, moly hexacarbonyl, H2SE, and hydrogen sulfide. Um, with that, finally, I'm going to come to the to UCC again and the philosophy with which it works. The idea is to develop strategies to grow high quality materials. You want to be, and this, these materials are being developed so that the community can use it and see how it works for you. So the process for how you do it is given is, uh, is given on the website. It is a call for, it's always open to user proposals. Please submit your proposals when, if in case it's accepted, we will be talking to you to find out what's the best way to meet your demands. Right now, what we are working on, or uh, we have been working with users, are samples of tungsten sulfide, molysulfide, tungsten selenide. Also, epitaxial graphene and CVD graphene, which is not a part of what I personally do, but then there are grad students who can help out with that. In addition to that, we're also looking at research proposals, which will help us uh, develop TMD, uh, familiar based TMDs. And with that, I would like to say thank you for your attention, and I could take any questions you might have. We don't see any questions online, so any questions in the room? For the new system you're setting up where you're doing optical characterization in situ as you do growth, um, what challenges come from doing optical characterization on something at 8 or 9 degrees Celsius? I imagine that's going to look different than if you're doing a room temperature afterwards. Uh, yes. So one of the reasons why we decided to go with the ellipsometry was that we looked at what would happen if in case we want to get a PL signal from these films. And it just diffuses out. You have a lot of fluorescence. But the ellipsometry is a technique which has been used previously in other growth chambers where the growth has been done at 1,000 degrees C. And it still seems to give information about the surface enough that we should be able to say something about what's happening. As to how well it will work, I am not sure. As of now, we have just done exidu ex uh, ellipsometry of these films. So after having gotten it, we hopefully we can get to discern enough about it that we can say something. So it's a valid concern. I'm not, I can't comment on all that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question on that. How about heterobilayers? Can you do, for example, monolayers of MOS2 on tungsten disulfide? That is what we are working on right now. So we would like to be able to say that, yes, we can grow monolayers of MOS2 on tungsten sulfide. Uh, but that's still work in progress. Have you run into any process regimes where growth switches from being planar to being on edge? Oh. Um, as of now, no. I think what we tried to do was to keep our tungsten carbonyl or the tungsten source uh, concentration low enough. So we have seen situations when we start increasing. Or for example, when we are talking about tungsten sulfide growth at 750 degrees C, mm -hmm. it is enough that we start seeing uh, like you know the layers growing out vertically outwards. But then, given the concentration is low enough, I think we are able to suppress that. It still does form the domains, but it does not want to grow out because the growth rate is not fast enough. Uh, do four people still have questions? Before people start leaving online, you had mentioned the proposals. Um, on this slide, and I just want to remind people online, I see some new people who haven't been here before. Um, we do encourage you at the 2DCC to speak to a scientist before submitting a proposal. And the reason being, we want you to be successful. We want you to understand all about the facility before <coughs> submitting your proposal. These do go to external review, um, and so the committee looks at those sorts of things. So you are encouraged to talk to us. You're not required to do so. Um, but we have found that the quality of the proposals has been increasing as people do contact us. So, any other questions online? Look like so. Any other questions in the room? Um, when you're doing the ripening step, you get the nucleation. In the AFM images, it looks like you know what kind of nucleus there is not necessarily single crystal or like, like it looks like it looks like you got a blob. Like is it something else? To start out with it is a blob. And even when we are at the end of the ripening step, you still see that there is a small blob sitting on the triangle. So that blob is not able to get off. But then when we start introducing more constant, 
the blob does become a part of the film. So, yeah, but then if you're looking at the domains per se, and I think maybe I can pull that up. Um, so, if you look at these still, if you look at the edges of these domains, they still look like they're already. So, yeah, the blob is there. It just doesn't want to come off because I think the barrier for it to come off is a little too high, so it just stays there on the top. Yeah, we have looked at these films right after ripening, and what we see is that it's just tungsten rich, tungsten selenite. It does have a lot of selenium in it, but it is mostly tungsten rich particles. Yeah, Any other questions? We got one coming in online, but anyone else? Okay, so does the, uh, uh, I guess it's talking about the source here, the tungsten CO6 decompose instantly? On the substrate, do you have any insight into this? For instance, if you omit the calcogen precursor, do you get metal um, tin films? Uh, we have looked at what happens when we expose the substrates just to the calcogen, and it does not leave behind any residue. There are some blobs at most, but then the selenium does not does not leave behind anything on it. The system, the surface looks as pristine as it was when we put it in, and that's what we are getting from the experience data. As to for what happens to tungsten carbonyl, I we don't know whether the reaction would happen on the surface because based on what is there in literature, apparently hydrogen selenide and hydrogen tungsten oxide carbonyl should be able to start breaking up. Uh, so I cannot say exactly where the decomposition begins to happen. Anyone else? Um, before everyone leaves, uh, next time on May 29th, we're having a tutorial on transport measurements and their importance, those sorts of things, from the Lakeshore Company. But let's thank uh, Tanu one more time, please.